So again, welcome everybody. Uh, I am Andrea and with me today is Abraham Bashir, uh, VP of Product at Amplitude. Uh, we are going to get started um, in about 10 seconds once I'm done speaking. Uh, but yes, we will have a Q&A at the end uh, if you can drop your questions on the Q&A box. Um, you can always add it on the chat as well, but the Q&A is just a little bit easier to keep track of. So if you wouldn't mind uh, doing it there. Uh, we will be uh, sending out the recording for this next week, and it will also be available on our YouTube channel, so you feel free to share it um, or watch back later if you have to drop off, no worries. Um, I'm going to shut down my audio and my video for the next little while, so Ibrahim, uh, go ahead. Alrighty, thank you, Andrea, and uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm excited to be here uh, to walk through the power of product feedback loops, <clears throat> and uh, feel free to sort of uh, chime in in the chat and the Q&A as, as we go through this, and we'll have time for Q&A at the end, obviously. So uh, let me start uh, just walking through sort of the things we're going to cover today. Uh, so a couple of seconds on introduction. I'm going to actually walk through um, the different ways uh, and means and uh, structure of getting product feedback. Um, I'm actually going to walk through some uh, real world examples. And then we're going to talk about some best practices and any patterns uh, that I've seen in my career. So first introductions. A little bit about me. So uh, uh, in reverse uh, chronological order, uh, my, my first product job was at Amazon working on the Kindle team. Um, I then went to Twitter and actually worked on the platform product. Uh, at Box, I led a bunch of different teams, including uh, developer and workflow products. And then I most recently, last week, actually uh, joined Amplitude to lead the core product. And at each of those companies, I've actually seen uh, uh, customer experience feedback loops be used in a very powerful way to actually drive the product forward, which is something I'm gonna delve into today. But I wanted to take a second and actually hear a little bit about um, our audience members today. So if folks in the chat could just put like, you know, a quick snippet of their bio and why they want to learn more about using product feedback, collecting product feedback, or leveraging product feedback. I'd, I'd love to hear that so it, you know I can shape sort of the rest of the discussion that way. And I'll give folks a minute just to chime in in the chat. Don't be shy, everyone. <laughs> I'm moderating as well. Uh, new to PM, says uh, Lourdes. Welcome, Lourdes. Well, one person, come on. I, I should, you know what? We should try, I'm gonna uh, start this again. We should try, um, I was gonna say what Adam tried on his webinar, which is, if you're here, say hello. <laughs> Simple as that. <laughs> yeah, but I oh, here see, we are. I see answers coming through. So we have product owner, uh, product manager, uh, product marketing manager, product manager in real estate. Uh, Enterprise okay. SaaS software, very cool. Thank you everyone for answering. Interesting. Okay, so we have a bunch of people new to PM. We have a bunch of people who are not product managers. Uh, we have a bunch of people who deal directly with customers. Um, very cool. Alrighty, okay. Now the, the, ch the chat is moving faster than I can read. So that, that's what I wanted. All right, well, thank you for, for taking a minute to introduce yourselves. Um, so let's jump right into it. Uh, feedback. So there's a lot of different ways that product feedback comes in. The first thing I wanted to talk about was actually the source of product feedback. So there's three basic buckets that this usually comes from. The first is your customer. And obviously, depending on the product you're running or involved with, uh, it could be a physical product, it could be a digital product, it could be something that you directly sell to customers, it could be something that you sell through an intermediary, um, you could be getting feedback from a user, a buyer, an administrator, a partner. So the first bucket of feedback is actually direct from the customer. Um, obviously, that's a very um, realistic take on what your product feels like to them, but it's also very expensive to get, uh, both in terms of your time and the customer's time. And obviously, there could be a lot of bias mixed in with who you're talking to. <clears throat> the second way people normally scale getting feedback is through proxies. So there's a lot of functions in every company internally that can help you gather that feedback, either explicitly 
or implicitly. So you could have a product research function or a user research function. You could have various go-to-market teams like sales and customer success that actually have touch points with the customer and they could synthesize that and share that with you. Um, and proxies are one way to sort of scale getting feedback in, although it's not direct. And then the third way is actually partners. So again, depending on the product you're in, you may have partners, you may have an analyst community, et cetera, that can actually distill that feedback and share it with you. Um, so again, there's a lot of different mechanisms for actually getting feedback. The second is, what do you do once you get that feedback, right? How do you actually operationalize it? So it could be inbound or outbound. What I mean by that is <clears throat> you have sort of folks always submitting feature ideas and requests and bugs, et cetera, to various channels like Zendesk, email, help desk, et cetera. Um, there's also outbound. You know, you do regular customer check-ins, customer calls, uh, quarterly business reviews, roadshows, uh, events, conferences, et cetera, where you go sort of uh, collect feedback. The second is actually in your product experience. What I mean by that is there's various touch points, especially now with digital experiences around your product. It could be during the pre-purchase uh, 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 assessment cycle. It could be post-purchase as part of support. It could be in product during the buy period, after the sale, during onboarding, et cetera. Could be web, could be mobile, uh, could be physical, could be a kiosk. Um, there's a bunch of different touch points you can use. And then the last piece of operationalizing feedback is whether it's scheduled or not. So a lot of times you get feedback when the customer is sort of in the middle of it. Um, you can also try to sort of pre-plan these things and have regular sessions like a beta where you ask for feedback in a structured way. So there's a bunch of different ways to operationalize it. The last step is how do you actually distill insight out of feedback. And this is the most important step in my opinion, which is the whole point of getting the feedback is to actually create a feedback loop so you can build better product and solve the problem better and actually generate more value, which helps your business and the customer. Uh, but there's a lot of challenges with distilling feedback. The first is biases. Um, no matter who you're getting the feedback from, there's going to be bias mixed into it, right? Uh, sometimes product managers will go try to validate the hypotheses they already have. If it's coming from your sales team, it might be incentivized towards what will sell. If it's coming from your support team, it might be skewed towards what is sort of the highest volume of, of load that they deal with. Uh, partners have their incentives uh, and the entire ecosystem sort of has its own biases baked in. So the one is sort of how do you remove bias from wherever the feedback is coming from? Uh, the second is actually uh, how many players are involved in the feedback. So, you know, in a normal product team, you have a, a product manager, product owner, uh, you might have a research function, design, engineering, uh, marketing, et cetera. Um, everybody's going to hear something differently when they talk to a customer or talk to a proxy or talk to an intermediary about what's going on. And the thing I find that works best is to actually turn it into a multiplayer thing versus have one persona actually collect and, and distill all the feedback, in which case you're getting a very um, uh, niche view. And then finally, uh, you want as much as possible for the learning to be ongoing and iterative versus a one-off. So for example, you have an idea, you then go seek out a bunch of customers to validate that idea is very different than you're constantly pressure testing ideas and putting small versions of the idea out there, getting a feedback and then iterating on it. And so I just walked through sort of a lot of different ways to get feedback, operationalize the getting of the feedback and then distilling it. But I wanna actually focus today on one specific branch of that entire tree, which is customer experience loops, which is direct customer feedback, live during the experience and a learning loop, which I feel like is the most powerful way to actually get product input and product instinct and develop that muscle as a product team over time. So let me actually walk you through an example or a few examples. And um, I'm actually going to use real world examples from companies that I've worked with. Uh, you know, I just rattled off my last four uh, career stops. So I'm actually going to use live examples from each of those. Uh, and I actually want to start with a really interesting anecdote. Um, I just put the, the money line of the quote here rather than spell out the whole anecdote. So I'll, I'll walk people through it. Um, just last week on LinkedIn, um, I saw a post from a, a, a person I'm connected to who basically talked about a time they met Jack Dorsey, um, who is uh, currently the CEO of Twitter and Square. 
And uh, this person was essentially sort of, it was a meet and greet as sort of a pre-interview. And the person said, Jack said, hey, let's just meet at a bar, right? Rather than sort of interviewing in an office. So they're sitting down at this bar and they're talking about Square and sort of the mission and the vision of Square. And uh, Jack's response to sort of what they're focused on uh, was to tell the candidate, watch the bartender. And basically he's like, if you watch the bartender, that person sort of gets an order, writes it down on a piece of paper, walks over to a machine, enters it, gets a ticket number, goes and sticks it on something where the kitchen is sort of uh, cooking up orders, uh, comes back, makes change, turns her back to the customer, fills a drink, turns around, talks to another customer. And the point was, all of the tools are getting in the way of the bartender actually interacting with the customer. There's so much friction and so much overhead and so many steps in the process that the bartender actually doesn't actually get to serve the customer much. They're actually just navigating the tools. And so what the bartender, what watching the bartender actually tells you is where all the friction in the process, in the customer journey actually lies. So I think that's an interesting analogy that I've started thinking about, which is just, you know, in your business, who is the bartender? Like who is the intermediary for the customer and what is getting in their way to actually solve the problem? And the bartender here might be sort of a system administrator. It could be a support agent. It could be whoever is having that touch point. And ideally as a product leader, what you wanna do is put yourself in the shoes of that bartender to actually build empathy for the problems they're dealing with. So the first example I want to walk you through uh, is at Amazon. Uh, at Amazon, they actually have a very interesting program that um, every person at a leadership level, um, let's call it like a senior manager or a principal, uh, engineer, PM, uh, QA person, et cetera, goes through, which is uh, they have a couple of different rotation programs. You can sort of shadow a call center uh, and see sort of what people are calling about, whether it's I didn't get my order or returns are hard or, you know, my package didn't show up on time and, and the types of issues they deal with during the entire order life cycle. Uh, you can actually also shadow a fulfillment center where you can actually see what it takes to package, fulfill, ship and meet various commitments. Um, and there's a bunch of really interesting things about this program. One is it's very different than actually looking at like aggregated uh, synthesized metrics like, oh, you know, number of orders that were on time versus late, right? Or number of commitments that met the customer promise, et cetera. You actually get to see the challenge of hitting those commitments real time, actually work side by side with those workers and actually start to develop the muscle of what's going on in these factories. And if you know anything about Amazon, um, operationally, they're excellent. And one of the reasons is everybody who's working on software that is customer facing or internal technology actually has a really strong point of view on what it takes to actually ship product. And so I think that's a really interesting example of giving uh, leaders, whether they're product people or not, uh, an entry point into the customer experience. So there's a touch point that you can insert yourself into and actually learn about that customer journey uh, hands-on. Um, so I think that's a really interesting uh, system that they have set up. Uh, the other thing I'd say is uh, when you get promoted to a certain level, you are actually sort of have to go through this to, to sort of meet your HR requirements. So one of the other interesting things they're doing is basically saying, in order to be a leader at this company, you actually have to invest the time in this program. And it's, and it's taken very seriously. Um, and that's something interesting, which is that a lot of companies, you have um, sort of folks on the ground are the ones who really see the challenges that customers are dealing with, you know, the call center folks, the fulfillment center folks, uh, the first line of support and the people making the decisions are actually very far removed, multiple layers removed. And other than sort of lines on a spreadsheet or bullet points on a PowerPoint, they don't actually see the real problems on the ground. So this is a way to sort of take the leaders and expose them to the real problems in the supply chain, um, which they can then bring back into their day-to-day -day decision making. And it's not a it's not a one time thing. It's a sort of an ongoing, you know, it, it, it keeping up to date because obviously the challenges of the order pipeline change year over year. So that's one concrete example. Uh, the second example I wanted to share was uh, Twitter. So uh, one of the really interesting things at Twitter is every employee essentially becomes a Twitter support person. Uh, so I, I, unless you've worked at Twitter, this is going to be maybe hard to follow, but basically the minute people find out you work at Twitter, you start getting inundated with a bunch of different emails and texts, which is, how do I get verified? Hey, I got locked out of my account. How do you unresolve this? 
And um, every person who works at Twitter essentially becomes sort of a support agent uh, in a way, which is that, you know, they go in and they say, hey, uh, there's this ticket that my, my friend filed, it's kind of stuck in the queue, or hey, what is the policy around this, or hey, can we nudge this one along? And initially, every employee feels really good about the fact that they were able to help somebody externally. They were able to help somebody get their account unlocked or their batch verified. And it's very interesting because it exposes you to the realities of actually running like a global service and what it takes to support people who are just dealing with very mundane problems like, oh, I upgraded my iPhone and now I'm locked out of two-factor authentication, right? Uh, the flip side of that is that knowledge is trapped in a disparate group of people, but nothing is being done to address the root problem. So for example, verification has been broken for a very long time. Uh, really, if you know somebody uh, and you're famous enough, that's how you get verified. But then the rules are kind of convoluted and there's always exceptions to the rule. And so on the one hand, uh, it's a great touch point for giving people uh, you know, a feel for what it's like to be on the outside and be an influencer and trying to get verified. On the flip side, all of that customer pain is not being distilled in a way where the problem is actually being solved. Um, so you can sometimes give people interesting customer experience uh, feedback touch points, but actually not complete the learning loop and address the core product problems. Uh, most recently, I was working at Box, so I wanted to give you an example from Box. Box actually has a very uh, interesting uh, customer connection program called the Executive Innovation Center. So basically, they have an entire floor set up where every week, you know, dozens of customers come through the Bay Area uh, and they bring whoever they want in their team. You know, it could be the buyer, it could be the administrator, it could be a developer, it could be a knowledge worker, uh, it could be sort of an implementation consultant, it could be a C level exec. And they just talk about their box experience, buying, using, uh, expanding, uh, you know, leveraging. Uh, and the conversations are wide and varied. And uh, it's a really interesting opportunity for anybody at the company basically to just walk downstairs, uh, you know, anytime, any week and just sort of shadow a, a customer call. And Boxworks is sort of the annual conference for the company. And one of the interesting things they do at Boxworks is they take these EICs, these Executive Innovation Center uh, talks, mobile. So basically they set up a bunch of cubicles at Boxworks, just hundreds of them. And people go from room to room. It's a very small, like cramped space. And you just get a rapid fire set of like sales and customer support meetings uh, compressed into two days, right? And so it's a really interesting opportunity, no matter what role you're in, uh, could be product, could be marketing, could be uh, engineering, to A, talk directly to customers, uh, B, actually have to work on your pitch, your messaging for what is the value of this product? How does it meet the customer needs? And actually help translate all the stuff they saw on the main stage during the product keynote and the demos. And so it's a really interesting test of can every person at the company articulate the value of the product um, and in a way that resonates and connects with customers. And obviously the majority of pipeline and deals come out of, of this conference. And so in a way, every person sort of becomes a marketer for a day. Um, so that's a really interesting way to sort of put on your seller hat and learn about positioning and, and messaging the product. Um, and then obviously I mentioned earlier, last week I just started at Amplitude on the product leadership team. And one of the really interesting things uh, that I've seen in my first uh, two weeks is every customer call, uh, as far as back as I can tell, has been recorded and is available. And you have sort of live transcripted uh, recordings of customers trying to use the product, uh, going through the learnings they've had, all recorded. And as sort of a new employee, you can actually just go through the journey with your customers and your research team of how the product evolved, why it evolved, what were the learnings that led us to ship certain things, try certain things, deprecate certain things, et cetera. Uh, and so this is a really interesting example of taking the corpus of learning, the knowledge base that has accumulated over time and actually distilling it down so that every employee new or sort of uh, you know new to product or sort of just wanting to understand the strategy better can actually come up to speed and learn about things. So that's that's the most recent example. Uh, so what can we learn from these specific examples of the field where these companies are using customer experience touch points to actually create uh, and, and iterate on a feedback loop? First is um, there's a huge uh, delta between just in time 
uh, versus always on. And, and so th this is sort of like the, the, the worst practices, the anti-patterns that, that can happen. What I mean by that is uh, at a lot of places, rather than having sort of these always on mechanisms to connect with customers and learn from feedback, you only do it just in time. So you've already decided what you're gonna ship and now you're gonna create a beta and you're gonna cherry pick a pool of people who are gonna provide you the right type of feedback to take that beta to generally available. And so you're just sort of just in time to meet your needs, gonna collect feedback. And, but it's not an ongoing learning experience, which I think is an anti-pattern. Um, the second is uh, you limit who can learn. So, hey, these meetings are only for executives, right? Or these meetings are only for product. And I think at a company that wants to be product-led uh, or a company where every employee sort of has skin in the game, you really wanna make sure you're not limiting access in any way. Obviously you have to structure things so that it's not overwhelming for the customer and it doesn't get in the way of sort of the support you're trying to provide, but limiting access is one way to make sure the knowledge is not disseminated correctly. Um, the third uh, is you can actually have the touch points and have the learning, but if you don't document it, and I don't just mean take notes, but actually synthesizing it, extracting the insights, socializing it multiple times to make sure people actually understand why we're doing what we're doing, that's an anti-pattern as well. So not documenting and socializing is, is definitely an issue. And then the last one is, uh, and this is what I was hinting at with the Twitter example, is uh, you, there's this backpack of knowledge and then there's this backpack of baggage of issues. And rather than uh, socialize it and make sure everybody sort of shares in that baggage, uh, some companies actually have a few people who carry it, right? So sometimes like an issue will blow up and it'll come out, well, the support team has known for a long time that this is an issue, right? Or the people who sort of deal directly with customers know this has been a pain point. Well, then why didn't we do anything about it? Because the burden has been carried by very few people versus everybody. Again, because it wasn't uh, disseminated correctly or because they lacked the channels and the mechanisms to actually influence the product strategy. So those are some ways it can go bad. But what are some ways where it's actually good and can be instilled as a best practice? So the first is, uh, you probably notice this in the examples, but it has to be sort of part of your cultural foundation. So it can't be a best practice that one team is doing or that product is doing or that design is doing. It actually has to be a cultural practice for the company. Uh, and that basically means that it's sort of part of your onboarding. It's part of your ongoing culture. It's part of how uh, people are sort of uh, uh, evaluated and motivated and incentivized and encouraged and the practice is ingrained. Uh, second thing I mentioned in the last slide is you all you want to make it accessible to every employee. So there's no reason why knowledge around customer value and customer pain should only be shared with a few set of people. So you really want to make it about every employee. Third is now that every employee culturally sort of has this best practice in their backpack, you want to make sure there are ways to interlock across functions so that go to market can talk to product development so that product development can talk to executives so that executives can complete the loop and, and hear directly from customers. So you want to make sure that communication flywheel is moving regularly. And then lastly, and this is very important, you want leaders to be the most well versed in what the challenges your customers are facing are. And so you really want to make it about the latter for leaders. So it's like, hey, you want to go from level X to level Y, you're actually going to have to show that you have a better handle on the customer challenges that this product in this company faces. So those are some of the best practices that I've seen that you can actually layer on um, to get to a really interesting uh, foundation uh, in terms of customer experience feedback loops. So I wanted to sort of take a pause here and actually open it up to questions if folks have them, and I'm assuming they do. All right. Um, we only have two questions right now, but I think that people are just a little bit shy. <laughs> so please, uh, if you do have any questions, drop them in the Q&A um, or the chat, I suppose. But Q&A would be easier. Um, the first one that we do have is, how do you think about uh, data analytics type of information and secondarily market research type feedback? Yeah, so I think um, just to be clear, I think direct live customer feedback is one type of input that I think is really important because it helps 
frame everything else. So it's not, it's not meant to say you should not be looking at analytics or metrics or that you shouldn't be looking at market research or external entities, but this type of direct customer feedback actually helps complete the story. Uh, and the reason I'm a big fan of this, especially for product people, is it helps on two fronts. One is part of your job is to tell a story and nothing makes a story more powerful than real customer anecdotes. And to be able to say, this is not a one-off, but this is a repeated pattern that I've seen. Two is if you can tell the story really crisply, you can actually align people internally to do what you need them to do, right? And so storytelling and alignment are one of the are two of the reasons why I think this type of feedback is more powerful, but that doesn't mean that the other channels for getting feedback are any less important. And obviously qualitative and quantitative go together. So sometimes you have instincts that you form that data can validate. Sometimes the data shows something that you can then go uh, double click into using these conversations. So I, I, I view them as virtuous versus exclusive. Uh, interesting question, but how can you do any of this as a startup when customers are minimal? So I think uh, as a startup, uh, on the one hand, yes, like you're getting a very biased point of view in that the, the denominator is very small. On the flip side, one of the ways I like to think about startups is you're building for one that represents many. And so in a way you could almost build together, right? Like you can think of who is your customer advisory board. So let's say you have like three customers, you are you actually do wanna be biased. You actually do wanna to talk to them and really genuinely solve the problem. And the, the one thing you wanna check yourself on is making sure that that very small group of customers represents a market, right? Which is the whole reason you have a startup to begin with. I was muted. I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, the next question is, um, how as a product leader, can you make sure you're still speaking to customers? I can drop into my team calls and monitor the feedback coming in, but I feel there's more that I could be doing. Yeah. So the, the first thing I'll say, I'll prevent myself from giving a speech, but as a leader, the only thing you have at your disposal is your time. Right. So the first thing I'd say is, where is your time going, if not to customers? And I don't mean to say 100 percent should go to customers. But if you feel like prioritizing time with customers is something you should do, then then you should prioritize it in lieu of the other things that can creep up on your time. So that's one is you can make the priority calls. Two is I think drop ins are good. Um, that's this is why I really like the amplitude practice of everything is recorded. So you can sort of consume when you see fit and go circle back with the teams that were actually live and say, hey, I heard this. What did you hear? And things like that. Right. And then third is uh, just make it a priority and actually figure out a subset of customers that you're going to focus on at any given point in time. So, for example, right now, I let's say I think onboarding is a challenge. So I'm going to go through and create a profile, a cohort of customers who I think have struggled with onboarding and spend some time with them. So it doesn't have to be like a broad universe of, oh, we have X customers. How can I possibly regularly talk to X? Slice it and dice it based on the type of learning you're trying to do. So there's a little bit of onus on us as product leaders to be thoughtful about what kind of customer feedback we're actually focused on at any given time. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, how do you know that the info you gather is representative enough for a high percentage of customers? Like if you have a hypothesis, uh, oh, sorry, too many, <laughs> too many questions. Uh, if you have a hypothesis, how do you know that you've essentially been able to validate it or invalidate it based on the amount of feedback that you've received? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the way I usually find that is iteration. So uh, one of the, the beliefs that I've slowly formed over the years is iterate, the number of iterations has a direct correlation to the quality of what you build. So small iterations early on lead to better, bigger products down the road. And so what I'd say is you don't actually know, but you have a theory and you have a conviction. So you should take something you learn from a small sample size, build something testable and iteratable and expose it to a large sample size. And then feed that data back in. I think where the, the thing you're highlighting becomes a problem is when you assume it's going to apply and you put all your you know, chips on the table and then it doesn't work out. And that's actually very sort of anti-iteration, anti-learning. It's you're, you're, you're almost betting the farm on, on one thing, which is probably not a, a good way to do things unless you actually have 100% conviction. Cool. Thanks for your question, Claudia. Uh, next question is, what mistakes should you be aware of when collecting feedback? Yeah, I think 
I mentioned this earlier, but to me, bias is the biggest one. And I, uh, I don't mean to imply that you can have completely unbiased feedback. I think the important thing is to, to answer your question about what mistakes is to be unaware of the biases and to not check them. So you should always know walking into a conversation, what are my biases? What are the biases of the other people in this room? What are the biases of the people we're talking to? And to just couch the feedback in that way. And sometimes you almost have to discount it based on how biased it might come across. So I think not acknowledging and correcting for biases is a big mistake. Excellent. Uh, next question is, what are your thoughts about companies forming a kind of a discovery team responsible for being closer to customers, as well as distilling those pieces of feedback uh, from existing and potential uh, customers? So uh, if by discovery team, you're talking like a user research function, I'm a big fan of that, mostly because I think it is a real skill and an art to do this correctly in an unbiased way. And it's real work, right? It's not just, oh, I heard this from a customer and cherry pick one quote and it's like, now we know what to build. You, you actually have to do this at scale repeatedly in a structured way uh, and disseminate all the learnings. Uh, the flip side is, you, so a, a function makes sense to own this, but then putting the entire burden on what you're learning, how you're learning, and the rate of learning shouldn't be on that function. You know, everybody has to participate. So it's kind of like saying, hey, we want to be more data driven. We intend in, in, invested in an analytics product. You still have to sort of change the data literacy of your company to take advantage of it, right? So do I believe in research? Yes, but you also have to get other people to buy in and be more research literate to take advantage of it. We have a few questions around tooling. Um, primarily, what do you recommend, um, you know, for prioritizing, understanding, um, preventing having to, you know, repeat the same thing over and over again and expose that feedback to everyone? Uh, do you have any advice around that? Yeah, um, I tend to think calling it a tooling problem masks sort of a organizational or a communication challenge. So I think there's plenty of tools out there that make it really easy for customers to uh, get feedback in and for internal employees to synthesize and summarize that feedback. I think where the challenge comes in and where the cultural foundation needs to be set is the interlock that happens between the front line of customer feedback and the people who are actually making product decisions. So I mentioned this earlier, but the idea of interlocks, go to market and product development interlocks, product development and executive interlocks are very, very important. Um, I, I saw a question that I wanna cherry pick, which is CS has a tight grip on customers. How do I get to open up the knowledge? I was just about to get to that one. Yeah, I, I love this question. So I think this is where, um, aligning cross company incentives is very important. I think if it's positioned as, you know, product has one goal and CS has another goal, obviously they're gonna maintain that tight grip. But I find CS, uh, and I'm using an umbrella term for support, uh, onboarding, professional services, uh, you know, account management, um, has one goal, which is customers actually using the product and using the product in a healthy, happy way so that they end up using more or expanding and buying, right? And so product and CS actually are very aligned on one North Star metric, which is product adoption. And I find using that tactic, which is you want the customer to adopt, I want the customer to adopt. It's not, you know, product's goal is not that they should use the features that product has prioritized. It's that they prioritize the features that would lead to adoption, which is also CS's goal, right? And you can connect it to secondary metrics, which is call volume, load time, uh, you know, reducing the top pain points as so that CS can actually focus on higher leverage activities. So I think having that conversation about we really both care about the same North Star metric is a great way to sort of break down those boundaries. Cool, thank you for that. Um, next question, how do you get feedback from prospects who compared your product with alternative alternatives and didn't choose your product? Yeah, I, I love this question. Uh, I picked up this trick from um, Aaron Levy at Box. Uh, you know, most of your CRM systems can give you distillations and most uh, companies uh, that I've been at share uh, when they win customer deals. It's like, we won this deal. This is who we competed with. And this is why we won, right? Uh, what they tend not to share is the deals lost. And one of the things I learned from Aaron was he would read all the loss notes of why did we lose? Who did we lose to? Was it a positioning? Was it feature gaps? Was it market perception, et cetera? And then he would actually take product action based on that. So two things here. One is 
you actually want to talk about those losses, even though you know it can be sort of demoralizing if you over-index on them, but why are we losing deals? Why are we losing accounts? Uh, and then the second is you actually have to document that stuff well. So I mentioned this earlier as an as a anti-pattern, which is when you don't document why you're losing things, that knowledge gets lost. So it's actually very important to understand why you may be winning or losing in the market. Going back to North Star, uh, other than product adoption, actual customer purchase behavior is a great in indicator as well. Um, so yeah, I, when loss notes are, I think, a great artifact of that. Cool. Um, we've got one here. Uh, what can you do to get unbiased feedback? Um, so I think uh, direct from the customer is one mechanism. I think making sure you're getting the feedback always on when things are not hot is very important too. Because if you only get feedback when it's like urgent that we close this deal or the customer is dealing with an issue or you know my order got screwed up and I'm mad and I'm calling now, you're gonna get a very biased set of feedback, which is why you actually have to have touch points at every point in the journey when the customer is happy, when the customer is unhappy, when the customer is like not even thinking about giving feedback and make it sort of an ongoing muscle versus only when you need it, in which case it's gonna get stretched and feel negative. Well, thanks for your question. Uh, what are some best practices in using customer feedback loops to improve those internal relationships with GTM functions? Does that mean? Go to market. Go to market, yeah. <laughs> My brain went to go to meeting and I'm like, what? <laughs> so End of the day for me. <laughs> I love the idea of interlocking with go to market teams. I would say uh, one of the best practices is when you can take something that came in through that feedback loop that go to market wanted to prioritize and actually prioritize it and show the value, that's one. It, it sort of reinforces the behavior on the market of a go to market person to say, oh, I had feedback. I felt it was relevant. I shared it. It got actually addressed and now we completed the loop, right? So that positive reinforcement is very important. And then two, it's also very important when you choose not to prioritize it to explain why. So a lot of times, a lot of product owners will say, well, you know, it's my decision and they'll just sort of put things in the in the plan and push things out of the plan. And I think it's very important to close the loop with the people who brought, brought it up saying, hey, I know you said like sign up flow was a huge pain point, but we're not going to prioritize that because why? Because we have data saying it's really not that big a pain point or there's an even bigger pain point. And that brings everybody into being a partner on the product strategy, which I think is very important and continues the communication and dialogue. We've got another question here. Um... Do you have a recommended framework or method for surfacing feedback on a recurring basis? Uh, uh, and who leads the sharing and how do you determine who attends to certain types of uh, feedback gathering situations like meetings or yeah. whatever? So uh, two things, I think you have to make it as lightweight as possible so that everybody can participate. Um, so I find, you know, t in these days, there's really like three tools that everybody always has open, some sort of email client, some sort of messaging client, and some sort of calendar client. So you got to make it to a point where just by virtue of staying on top of your email or your Slack or Teams or whatever, you're going to get hit with the insights, right? You don't want to turn it into, we have amazing research, but it's in this like convoluted knowledge repository that you need to get three levels of access to get into, right? So one is make it easy to get to the knowledge. Two is whatever rituals and customs you have as a team, weave it into that. You do a Monday morning metrics review, weave it into that. You do a Friday afternoon product demo, weave it into that. Keep bringing in the customer storytelling and where you got the hypotheses and which touch points led to you prioritizing those bets uh, as part of that practice. So I, I'm a big fan of lightweight and rituals versus over the top and, you know, like, you know, once a quarter, we're going to talk about research. And, and if you don't make that meeting, you're not going to learn. We've got two interesting research questions. The first is, do you have any advice on setting up a research team in the product org? Yeah, the, the first thing is, um, this is more of a generic answer. Any function that you're trying to introduce, like you know, a product team at a simplest level might be a PM and engineers. And there are a bunch of other functions that can get introduced based on your product's focus and your organization's maturity level. Design, SRE, QA, 
uh, research, uh, program management, et cetera. What I'd say is whenever you want to introduce uh, another function that has a seat at the table, you want to start lightweight. You want to prove out the value and you want other teams to come clamoring and saying they seem to be shipping more, shipping better and moving the needle more uh, with less effort. How do I do that? right? Oh, research is an answer to doing that. Great. What you don't want to do is come over the top and say, we are now going to be research driven. Everybody spend time on research. So I think trying to boil the ocean is difficult. I think picking a couple of receptive teams um, who want to build that muscle and starting small is ideally the way to go in generally introducing any kind of tool process or function. And speaking of tools, uh, you spoke about recording customer feedback and stories so that new people could get up to speed. Uh, how do you make those stories easily consumable? Yeah, so I actually um, posted about this the other day. What Amplitude is doing is all the calls are recorded with a tool called Gong. And you can watch the video, you can just listen to it like a podcast, and you can actually read the transcripts and just listen to portions of it. So it has a really nice interface where you can skip around based on who's talking. Um, so I find myself doing that, which is like, yeah, I don't want to be staring at a computer screen. I want to go for a walk. I load up a couple of customer calls uh, and just listen to them. And one of the really interesting things I've done is when I meet people, I ask them, uh, what is sort of the most insightful customer call that they've heard? And then I go add it to my playlist. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that. Next question is, oh, I love this one. How can you convince the organization that it's not only okay, but powerful to experiment and iterate directly on the product? Our current approach is running a phased approach to get feedback outside of the product design and complete the feature, then release the feature and then get feedback to see what it is that we might need. Yeah, I think this is um, almost like a philosophical belief type question. And you know, having worked in enterprise software, a lot of customers don't want to be experimented on and a lot of uh, leaders are afraid to sort of be the person who gets called out for you know confusing the customer uh, i think this this is one of those you either believe it or you don't believe it so you either fundamentally believe in iteration leads to quality over time or bing bang approaches are the way to go so uh, i think it, it's worth calling out like if we have that belief why are we afraid to do it in product right uh, and then actually get to the heart of that versus uh, uh, the, the other issue. And if, if the fundamentally there's not a belief in um, you know, iterative as a way to develop, I think then you need to work on sort of the maturity level because it is a pretty common best practice at this point is small bets that evolve over time versus you know, huge releases. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. How can you best handle customer requests for your existing products when the company focuses on development of a new product and new revenue? Yeah, I mean, th this is a pretty common issue because, you know, the shiny objects get all the attention and time. Um, I find it interesting. Sometimes there's like very basic metrics that get missed by everybody. I think with most SaaS products, like 80% of your revenue comes from renewals of your of your core product, whereas 80% of the attention is always on, hey, we have this new thing coming. So I always like to remind people, which is while we're trying to sort of like, you know, figure out how to ship the new thing, the business is actually run by the old thing. Right, and the old thing needs uh, attention, time, and care. And so, uh, I like to use that as a reminder of like, if you forget the base, if you, if the original flywheel grinds to a halt, you're gonna lose the potential to actually add on to anything. Right. So you don't want to let the foundation crumble. Is is usually one tactic I take there. Excellent. We've actually gotten to the end of all the questions. So if you have another question please add it. Uh, if not, we will fill this moment with some chatter <laughs> while we wait. Um, oh, are you hiring? <laughs> yes, Dave. Are Find you me. hiring? <laughs> uh, yes, I am. Find me on LinkedIn. <laughs> Done. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, Amplitude is hiring uh, for quite a few roles. So um, you can check that out uh, either by following uh, Ibrahim on um, LinkedIn or just checking out amplitude.com. I guess there's a careers page. Um, but yay, the answer is yes. Any other questions, anyone? Shy gang? No? Uh, did we skip any questions or we, we got them all? Uh, there were some that were repeat um, about tooling and things like that. Uh, but you answered that earlier. Uh, so we got through those. Uh, Oh, here we have another one. Uh, what is your suggestion for products migrating from on-prem to SaaS? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, incentives drive our behaviors. I would bring it back to um, why you need to migrate to the cloud and to SaaS, which is operational costs, not having to carry that, that burden, uh, always sort of having the latest and greatest without having to patch and upgrade and do all that stuff. Um, uh, when you say any sweet balance, I guess, could you clarify the question a little bit? Are, are you asking more from a customer point of view or from a product builder point of view? And then while Claudia is clarifying, I think Radek has a question, which is, how do you get feedback from prospects who didn't choose your product? Um, one, I, I find asking strangely works. Like you just ask people, it's like, hey, you chose our product and you, you chose not to use our product, why? And they'll love to tell you. Um, two is I think you can sort of incentivize it a little bit. You know, it's like, hey, we're doing a research study, gift cards if you participate. Um, three is persistence actually pays off, right? And then four, this is where proxies actually come in. You can talk to analysts and they will tell you saying, oh, you know, in a usual bake-off, your product gets compared to X, Y, Z. This is when customers choose X, Y, Z, these are the reasons why. So analysts will give you like market insights, SWOT analyses, et cetera, which I find really useful, especially with SaaS products. Um, not sure if Claudia is gonna respond. I, I, I did have one oh, more slide. There we oh. go. Uh, you are moving to SaaS because that is, a, but what is the pace of potentially stopping to invest in the, oh, I see what you're saying. I think um, you really need to do some uh, high level back of the envelope math of, you know where you need to get to, but you cannot churn your entire on-prem legacy customer base while you get there, right? And there's there's tons of stories out there in the market of companies that move fast and it was too fast and companies move fast and it was hindsight, it was the right thing to do. So it would be silly of me to, to sort of give you a formula here. I think it's a tricky balance of you got to know when you get to where you're going, which is sort of a SaaS based product, which of your customers are going to come along with you and which are going to attrit. And it comes down to what is an acceptable level of churn while you're on that journey and manage it very carefully. So every time you put a dollar into the legacy product that you know is eventually going away, you just have to make sure you're doing it for the right reasons versus throw away money. Uh, uh, I just wanted to leave this slide up there. I know people are asking how to connect. Uh, on Twitter, I'm Ibscribe. So just feel free to at mention or follow. I, I try to keep up with notifications. Um, here's a short link, tco.ib. Um, it leads to my LinkedIn page and you can sort of connect over there. If you're wondering how I got a URL shortener from Twitter, I made it years ago and they never changed uh, for you know, very logical reasons. Um, if you want these slides, just look me up on speaker deck and you can uh, download these slides and use them. Uh, and then finally, if you're interested, I have a newsletter, um, which you can subscribe to. Uh, someone just asked, are you on Clubhouse? I am not. I, I downloaded it and tried it for two minutes, but it was a little hard for me to navigate and felt a little bit uh, venture capital heavy. So I just, I abandoned <laughs> I don't know if that's a hot take. <laughs> I, I'm on Android, so I don't even know what Clubhouse is. I'm, I'm very out of the loop with those things. I, I guess it's kind of like an on-demand. It's a bit of a FOMO thing, right? <laughs> None for me. Uh, next, we have one more question. Um, how do you correctly manage customer product returns or negative feedback? Or is there such a thing as negative feedback? Yeah, I, I guess I'll answer this. Yeah, I'll answer this question in two ways. One is, um, let's say you're the Amazon, you know, people returning it, your, your issue there is you want to make the return as seamless as possible and make the return process less onerous, right? The second is, let's say you're the creator of the product that is being returned and you sell it directly to customers. Then you're like, why are people returning my product? I think you want to put a low friction um, mechanism for customers to do that, right? especially at points where you know they're going to be forced to interact. So it's like, as part of completing the return, throw up a survey of like, why are you returning, right? Uh, a lot of times hotels will say like on departure, uh, you know, why did this happen? Especially if you cut your stay shorter, things like that. Um, and so I think it's very important to listen when people are returning your product because they're telling you something, right? Uh, but I think you can't over-index on it because there's a lot of other pressures that go into churning or returning cost pressure, other things going on in life. And so I think you have to hear that feedback, but you have to distill it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, we're gonna give you another chance to perhaps ask a few more questions if you have any. 
the one for unbiased feedback was answered earlier, by the way. Uh, just thought I'd drop that in. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to go back uh, when we send you the recording on that. Uh, but yes, it was definitely answered. Um, I'm not seeing any additional questions pop up. Um, so perhaps at this time, I might say thank you very much, everyone, for joining today. Thank you, Ibrahim, for your time uh, and for sharing all of your knowledge. Um, I thought, oh, we were getting anything. <laughs> we were just getting thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Yeah, um, thank, you, um, thank you, Andrea, for, for hosting and for having me join. And thank you, everybody, for participating. Awesome. As I said, we will be sending the recording out over the next couple of days. So feel free to share it. Um, you can follow Ibrahim. Uh, his details are on the screen. Um, and of course, you can follow uh, PropPad. See you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.